Okay, so we're going to be talking about geometry optimization. So last time, in, in, in a little bit with the Z-matrix, we talked about the input files. So now we're going to look at the jobs that we can do. The first job typically is to put in an initial guess of the molecule and then optimize that geometry. So in Gauss view, this is the, you go up to the calculate menu and do the Gaussian calculation setup, and you get this panel down here. It's got all these tabs across the top. Um, we're going to be talking about job type and method today, uh, title, and this link zero is, is also that percent card that I was talking about. Um, this, this stuff over here, we're not really going to talk about this whole course. But it does have a, a solvation tab, but I've never been able to get any satisfactory results out of it. So I don't know. I'm throwing Gaussian under the bus, but it's, you know, it's, it's never been, uh, it's never been that great of a model, in my opinion. So this is uh, the method tab. Let's look at that first. So we need to decide if we're going to be doing a ground or excited state calculation. In this course, we're going to be doing all ground state calculations. Um, uh, it also has this uh, thing called level of theory. So this, this right here is the, the theory. And then this right here is the basis set, obviously, basis set. So you need both of those parts. Okay. Now, it depends, too, on, on charge and this, this spin or multiplicity. And this S right here is the net spin. On the molecule. So let's just, or atom. So let's just take, we have a hydrogen atom and it's got that, that single electron spinning around, right? Okay, so that, that electron has a spin of one half. Okay, so S is one half. So 2S plus 1 is going to be 2. So it'll be a doublet. And so that's what goes in, you do the drop down, the singlet, doublet, triplet, etc. That's what's shown right here in this part of the input file. So right after defining the kind of calculation you're going to do, you have the spin, you have the, the charge and multiplicity. Gaussian will um, occasionally give you, an, you know, you, if you have that wrong, it'll occasionally tell you that it's wrong. Other times it will go ahead and do the calculation. Like for oxygen, if you just do zero one, because that's the way it is for 99% of the molecules, you'll get the wrong result for the ground state of oxygen. So the ground state of oxygen is actually a diradical. It's a triplet. It has two unpaired electrons. And so the net spin is one. So two times one is two plus one, three. So the ground state of oxygen is a triplet. Okay, that's a triplet oxygen is lower in energy than singlet oxygen. So, so that's that's the one classic example of where people get that wrong because they get used to just doing zero charge singlet spin, and they get to oxygen and they get the wrong uh, set of calculations. So, um, another way to sort of so this little two times s that's essentially counting up the number of electrons. So it's the number of unpaired electrons plus one is what we're calculating. So then let's talk about these model chemistries. So we have, uh, yes? Yes, it's good, yeah, thank you. So we have these uh, theoretical models and just like we have model kits and you would never compare, say, the model kit from this manufacturer, which was a particular size with particular bond lengths and angles and so on, to a model kit from a different manufacturer, right? Because they're gonna be different bond lengths. You're trying to measure the size of a whole molecule. You build it with this model kit and you look at it and say, okay, it's about a foot across. And then you build it with a model kit made for a classroom demonstration, same molecule, but now it's three feet across. It wouldn't make sense to compare those two, right? To say, well, this molecule is bigger than this molecule because the, um, the model chemistry is different. Same thing computationally. If you're gonna use a particular type of calculation for a molecule and you wanna compare it, to a different molecule, you need to use the same level of theory uh, and the same theoretical model for each. So a theoretical model contains a, 
this basis set and, and this, uh, this theory. So the basis set is related to the electronic structure. These calculations are called electronic structure calculations because we give them the location of the nuclei and then Gaussian, the software, calculates the structure of the electron cloud. Um, we can also do gra graphical models like molecular orbitals, electron densities, and potential energy surfaces. And we walked out in the hall last time and looked at some molecular orbitals. Uh, there's also practical information. So there are different file types. So uh, the input files are plain text, meaning you can read them on any computer um, using any of the text editors. They can read them on the, on, uh, on the Linux system uh, using VI. So if you do work on the, the high power computing and you're working on a Linux system, you may want to go and watch a few videos on how to use the VI editor. <laughs> okay. Cause it's, it's all, there's no mouse. Okay. So it's just all text based. And so it's a real pain to use, but it is fast. If you don't have to leave, you know, sort of leave, log out, go into your computer, make a change, then transfer your file, log back in, transfer your file and, Log in, it's a pain. So if you could just edit your files right there on Linux, that's great. Uh, the Gaussian job file, GJF, that's the typical file extension. Older versions used .com, uh, but then that became, you know, used for other things. And so now they've switched over to the Gaussian job file. There's the checkpoint file, which is a binary file. So when you're doing this calculation, you're calculating enormous clouds of data and it's more efficient to save that in a binary format. So they save it in a binary format in this checkpoint file. It contains the numerical values of the molecular orbitals. And then you could have it be formatted so you could read it uh, with a text editor, and that would be a formatted check file, uh, checkpoint file, and that's FCHK. I just give you this because if you're working with these systems, you need to know what the file extensions are so that you can like, understand um, you know, what, what each file means related to your calculation. And then the output files, also plain text, readable by notepad, um, would be a log files, older versions used out, .out. So this is just the practical information surrounding doing Gaussian calculations. This is the, the, the most important one. This is your input file. And then this is your output file, this .log. And then this is really important too. You need to load this one if you're going to do any work with molecular orbitals or any of the surfaces of the electron cloud. So this actually contains the structure of the electron cloud. And this contains the structure of the of where the nuclei are. And they are very long files. Don't ever print them. <laughs> Okay, and it's 90% useless information because these calculations iterate. And we'll see that today real quick. We'll get to that here soon. So this is the number one approximation that allows us to do these calculations. It's the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And so have you ever been out, outside and you had the little gnats, these tiny little bugs that get around your face and they're trying to fly in your ear and everything like that? And, and you wave your hands and you don't ever hit one and you can move and they follow you and why can't you hit them because you're slow compared to them right and you swing at the gnats and they, your hand's not even moving to them right so they can move out of the way you know and and so that's what so this person moves and the gnats don't even know that he's moved i mean so because you're you're way more than a thousand times the mass of a gnat and the nucleus is way more than a thousand times the mass of an electron so in this analogy, the electrons are the gnats, okay? And so they can't even tell you're moving just like the, ele the electrons can't even tell the nuclei are moving. So we can totally separate the locations of the nuclei from the behavior of the electrons. This is what allows these calculations to work. We give them the static positions of the nuclei and they calculate the electron cloud uh, structure, the electron structure. And then the computer can move those nuclei and calculate the cloud again and see if the energy went down. And if it went down, we're at a more optimized geometry. And then it moves it again 
and then calculates the structure. So every one of those moves of the nuclei then allows the, the gnats to find a different position. And then we calculate how all the Coulombic charges are minimized. And we say, okay, we're at a lower energy now. So this, uh, this energy equation is how we calculate the energy of the whole molecule. So this is the, the Hamiltonian, which goes into the Schrodinger equation, and it has two major pieces, a kinetic energy piece and a potential energy piece, okay? And the kinetic energy piece calculates the curvature of the wave functions, and the potential energy piece, in particular for our molecules, we have positive nuclei and negative electrons. So we have repulsions of the nuclei, that's this VNN. And then we have the attractions of the nuclei to the electrons, vice versa. And then we have the repulsions of the electrons from each other. So here's all of the math. It looks pretty ugly. But it's really not that bad, actually. So here, alpha and beta are nuclei. And I and J are electrons. So we can see here that we've got the math. We, we sum through the the wave functions of all of the nuclei. And this is the second derivative operator. So it's looking at the curvature of those wave functions of the nuclei. And then the same thing, we sum through all of the electrons, taking the uh, second derivative of all of the, all the electrons. We have the mass of the electron here, the mass of the various nuclei there. Uh, this del, this upside down delta, that's the, the second derivative over all space. And so we would, take the derivative with respect to x, leaving y and z as constants, and then we would take the second derivative with y, leaving x and z constant, and so on. So we would take those partial derivatives of, of all of those wave functions. So that's the kinetic energy piece, the nuclei kinetic energy, the electron kinetic energy. Then we get into the potential energy terms. And now these are pairwise con con uh, conditions. And so we sit on nucleus alpha, okay, and we, so we pick nucleus alpha. And so if I'm nucleus alpha, then I look at the Coulombic distance to this nucleus. So you're, you know, the next one. And then I look at the Coulombic distance to that one and that one and that one. So I do all of the others and sum up all of those repulsions. And then I move to the second one. We've already calculated this one. So then we do your repulsion to all the others and then your repulsion to all the others. We don't include these two because we've already calculated that. So we sum up all the repulsions. You see it's positive. Those are, those are increasing our energy because they're repulsive, but then the attractive ones decrease our energy, so they're negative. So this, is, uh, this one's negative. We sit on a nucleus and we calculate the attraction of all the electrons. So we go around the whole cloud and I see how all the electrons are attracted to my position. Then we go to you calculate the attraction of all the electrons to you and you and you and so then we we look at how this calculates the total energy of the molecule and then this last one's called electron correlation and this is the one that breaks us because we can't we don't have a, a solution for this because we're not treating our electrons as discrete um, particles in space they're actually a wave function associated with those electrons so we have a real problem with this last term, this electron correlation term. So there's lots of levels of theory, and that's the term that we use, levels of theory for how we calculate this electron correlation piece. Because we're not dealing with discrete gnats. Really, the gnats are treated like a wave function. Now, we can take the, the average position or most probable position for the electron and sit there, and then we can, you know, maybe do some sort of calculation on the most probable positions of the other electrons, but it's it's not very accurate. So we've got other ways to try to come up with that. Now this is the particle in a 1D box, Hamiltonian. So we've come a long way. Now we've got a, a whole lot more terms in this one. So since the electron correlation can't be solved exactly, we have to approximate it. So these are the different model chemistries. Molecular mechanics, semi-empirical, ab initio, and configuration interaction, and then density functional theory. So we're going to use this one for sure. Okay. And we might might play around with some of these others. I think there's even now a PM6, which I would probably use that one. 
and then this UFF. We'll talk about all of these individual, individually. So let's look at me molecular mechanics. One way to get get away from calculating the electron co correlation is just to ignore all the electrons. <laughs> And this works pretty well for molecules that obey the rules, like this molecule up here. You know, our, we can come up, come into that molecule and we can guess those angles of 109.5 and it, they're gonna be close, okay? But what about a molecule like this, um, cyclopropane? What's wrong? Yeah, oh, you couldn't find it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was like, uh-oh, something broke. Why is this molecule one that breaks the rules? Every carbon has four electron domains. So going back to valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, it should take a tetrahedral arrangement around that, that carbon. And a tetrahedral arrangement of the four electron domains would have what angle between those four domains? 109.5. These carbons are 60 degrees off from each other. Very strained, right? Because it wants to be 109.5 and it's 60. Okay, so this, was, this, this UFF would have a difficult time with this kind of molecule. So... Um, so molecular mechanics, um, let's see this, not good for this. Does that make sense? It's very good for the molecules that are close to the Vesper shapes, okay? And that includes trigonal planar, tetrahedral, you know, all these different kinds of atom types, because it goes through and it says, well, how are these atoms connected to each other? And if they're connected with, um, you know, uh, three domains or two domains or four domains, it, it has different types of carbons that have different parameters. So these, these little parameters here will be for each type, for each type of pairwise combination. It will know what a carbon hydrogen energetic is and a carbon carbon energetic and all of these different energy terms and it will calculate the energy of the molecule based upon the distances between all of the pairs so that's what we call it a uh, leonard jones 612 potential so you have an attractive piece no you have a, a repulsive piece that's to the 12th power minus a, an attractive piece that's the sixth power so this repulsive piece right here drops off as you know, as one over R to the 12th. So it drops off very fast. And then this one comes up as minus one over R to the sixth. Okay. So this is good because we don't have to calculate any electrons. It's great for, for very large systems, proteins, polymers, you're gonna use molecular mechanics, okay? So if you're um, doing your Gaussian project on a really big molecule, which I don't know, but it may be possible, um, then you would uh, use molecular mechanics. Any questions on this one? It's really fast. If you think about, let's say we have a thousand carbon atoms in, in some sort of polymer. You say, well, that's a thousand. That's going to take a while to calculate. Yeah, but how many, how many electrons did those thousand carbons bring? It brought 6,000 electrons with them. So if we can ignore the electrons, we go from something that has 7,000 particles, 1,000 carbons and 6,000 electrons, to something that just had 1,000 particles. You see the, inter the, the computational savings just in the number of loops you have to do to calculate the energy. So, okay, so this is how you would select it under method. You would pick mechanics under level of theory, and you could pick any one of these options. Okay, okay semi-empirical methods. Uh, this uses the full Hamiltonian that we showed earlier without the electron correlation term, but it only shows it on the valence electrons. So how does that simplify our six electrons on carbon? It gets rid of the core electrons. So it doesn't use two of them. It needs the four electrons for bonding. And so it'll just calculate the valence electrons. And, and the thing is, how does it tell the difference between carbon and silicon? So they both have four electrons. 
Well, it uses these things called effective core potentials. It puts different nuclear charges on the different types of atoms. So that's how it can tell the difference between a silicon and a carbon. And so it would say, well, the silicon does have more protons, but it's also got more electrons shielding it. So if it makes it a little bit uh, smaller charge, then those electrons are a little further from the nucleus. So it'll say the silicon is a little less charged than the carbon. And how do they adjust those charges? How would you know what the shielding charge on a carbon or a silicon is? You would use experiments. So you might calculate the CH4 molecule and calculate the bond lengths and angles, you know, the structure of that in the sil silicon H4, SiH4. And you would adjust the, the charge on the nuclei to match the experimental bond lengths. Make sense? So this is a really, it's been tuned to match experimental data and that's why it's empirical. So semi-empirical, that word empirical has some reference to experiment. So they take the experimental structure of the molecule, the bond links particularly, and they adjust the charges on the nuclei so that they can get rid of all the core electrons and save time. So these are pretty fast as well. So, um, and also good for atoms that don't break the rules. So it might have difficulty for a cyclopropane type setup. So here under theory, you would select semi-empirical and then come over here, like the most modern version that I know of is PM6. And then PM stands for uh, per parameterization method. So they basically whatever, it's the sixth version of their parameterization method in adjusting those core charges. Then we get into ab initio and density functional theory. So if we come along here, we have lots of options. We can pick um, uh, mechanics or some empirical or Hartree-Fock or any of these others. So let's go through a few of these. All of these methods, ab initio and density functional, have to have, to have two parts. And that's what I have up here, HF slash STO3G. This is the basis set part. That's the level of theory part. So HF. If you were to select Hartree-Fock from this drop-down menu, in behind the scenes, in the input file, it would put HF. And so this ignores electron correlation completely. So it calculates that full Hamiltonian, but just leaves that fifth term off. And you say, well, how can that even be useful? Well, if I'm comparing two molecules and both reactants and products, say, are ignoring that piece, then when I take the deltas, they kind of cancel out. So I'm, I'm wrong the same amount, roughly, on products and reactants. So it works pretty well. Uh, these others, this is just added information for you. Uh, MP stands for this particular perturbation theory, uh, mahler plessis perturbation theory. CC uh, deals with coupled clusters. So what it does is it, it takes uh, not just the ground state electron cloud, but adjusts it and puts some electrons up in some of the excited states. Uh, we won't use either one of those. Then you have density functional theory. And the best way I've heard this described is that it, it deals with, um, with the electron cloud more as a whole rather than individual wave functions. So um, that's really all I know about it. Um, but it does give you pretty accurate results, uh, but it's um, much faster than the ab initio methods. So it also requires two parts, level of theory and basis set. Uh, you would pick density functional theory from, from this theory section, and then you would pick the particular functional. Um, so we use this one, B3LYP, and uh, this Austin parameterization functional with dispersion is like the latest one. So this is um, a more modern one. Uh, it's it's new, okay. So this, I mean, new is like the last five years. <laughs> okay. Okay, we also need this basis set for building out the electron wave functions. So um, one way we can deal with this uh, electron correlation is as we loop through all those electrons, I can't, if I don't want to take into account, if, if I'm sort of calculating the effect of the other electrons on me as an electron. I can loop through like the electron correlation term says and calculate the repulsion of sort of the most probable position of those electrons. Or I can say 
with the structure of the electron cloud that I've calculated so far, you've reduced the nucleus a tenth of a charge and you've reduced the nucleus a tenth of a charge. And so I can adjust the other attractive term and, and that's a lot faster. And so that's what's going on here is uh, we're treating each electron separately, but we're calculating reduced charges on the nuclei, kind of like the semi-empirical method. So here are the basis set options. Look at all of these. There's lots of choices. It's an alphabet soup. How would you know which one to pick? Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what these numbers mean, this, this 6 and 3, 1 and G and all of that business. Uh, you'll see also this double zeta, triple zeta, quadruple zeta. That shows up here, this 1, 1 and 1. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about these things. So STO3G is Slater type orbitals. And that's going to be the one that you can at least understand the, the easiest. In your freshman chemistry, when you're building up the structure of an, of an atom, you start with the 1s and then go to 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, and so on. And you're not really dealing with um, the non-ground state electron configurations. Okay, uh, That minimal number of orbitals that you have for the electrons would be the, this STO3G, minimal basis set. And some of these others, it's adding some extra um, Gaussians to give the electron more freedom. So the bottom line of all of these basis sets is the more freedom you give the electron, the lower the energy. So here's why we're using Gaussians. This, this function here is actually um, the actual radial distribution function. So an electron attracted to the nucleus is attracted to that e to the minus x uh, a, a dependency. Uh, but the integrals of those or the derivatives of those are much slower. We could, we could save a ton of time if we could use this r squared. This is a Gaussian. But notice what the Gaussian does here at the origin. It's, it's different by this amount. And so that's a substantial amount of error. It's faster, but it's wrong. <laughs> right. uh, but it's so much faster that we can build up a function by adding more Gaussians. So I can add this tiny little Gaussian and this Gaussian to kind of build up this middle piece and still match the function out here quite well. And so that's what we're doing is we're adding more and more Gaussians to approximate the actual function. Okay. So that's why the program's called Gaussian. So we're taking the natural e to the minus r and we're, we're sub substituting that with an e to the minus r squared. And so that's, uh, that's what's in these numbers here, how many Gaussians we're adding in to approximate that radial distribution function. Now that's the distance from the nucleus. What about the angles? And so then we can add in the spherical harmonics, the p's and d and f orbitals, and we want to give the electron more freedom. So why not, if I had a hydrogen atom and I want it to hydrogen bond better, why not give it some p orbital functionality, like maybe 10%. So I can put p orbitals on the hydrogens. I can put d orbitals on my carbons and so on. And you say, but wait, carbon doesn't have d orbitals, right? It's on the second row. It has them, but it's just not excited enough to use them. There's a 3d on a carbon, or there could be. And so I could add in some d orbitals on my carbon, and now my carbon can do things that are not 90 degrees. It can do things that are 60 degrees, and I can make cyclopropane. Okay. Now, that's going to be a little bit higher energy, but that's okay. We call that, in organic chemistry, ring strain. But what Gaussian's doing is like, I'm going to give it some of this higher energy orbital, this d-type orbitals, to allow it to make a 60-degree bond. Okay, that's going to be higher in energy. Well, great. Gaussian's calculating the ring strain by using d orbitals. So, so in, orbit, in order to allow the molecule to take strange shapes or give that electron more freedom so it can find uh, better bonding arrangements, we add in these things called polarization functions.
and we can put them on all the all the other atoms like the heavy atoms and hydrogen so gaussian is just built up from the beginning to set to treat hydrogen differently than the other atoms and you can also think about it was the first molecules done on gaussian were all organic molecules probably hydrocarbons and think about like methane and so on methane you've got five atoms but only one of them is a, is not a hydrogen and so if you could put polarization functions on the carbon and leave the hydrogens alone and stay, save a lot of time. So they sort of set the hydrogens aside. That's why we have heavy atoms and hydrogen treated separately. Because again, you, you can save some time by not putting polarization functions on hydrogen and still treat the heavy atoms differently. They sort of extended that idea of setting up zones uh, of interest to uh, to larger molecules, and they um, got a Nobel Prize for it. So now for proteins and enzymes, you can treat like the pocket of an enzyme with a high level of theory and treat the rest of the enzyme with, with molecular mechanics and the software that it took to make that uh, won a Nobel Prize. <clears throat> so you can add this higher angular momentum or higher polarization functions on here. Then you could also give it more... Uh, functions that are further away from the nucleus. Those are called diffuse functions, and those are great for anions and transition states. So if you're gonna be calculating transition states, you would wanna add some pluses in your basis set, and that would give the electrons even more freedom to go further from the nucleus. So here's a summary of the basis sets. For huge systems, up to thousands of atoms, use molecular mechanics or semi-empirical. If you have an anion, you want to use this diffuse function, this plus here. The first plus would go on the heavy atoms. The second plus would go on the hydrogen. <clears throat> if you had transition states or strained rings, you want to give it some more polarization functions. And this is uh, from the one of the authors that, that writes about Gaussian. He says this is a, a, a basis set that he uses all the time. <clears throat> so is just a summary. Um, for my research, I was using the DFT method. Yes. And I used the basic LAN D2, D plan. Yeah, LAN 2 dz so, Yeah. But now you said when the molecule is 200 to 2,000, yes. you use the mechanical tracing. If it's really large, like a 2,000 atoms? Yeah, my, the molecule I was calculating is very huge. Like sometimes I, I have like 250 atoms, 300 atoms. And I'm still using the the that yeah. basic. So with the I, I DFT? That, yeah, that's one of the things I do uh, for this. How long time how long are your calculations taking? Most time it takes a week. Just the same one yeah. like five days, four yeah, days, that's six right. days. Yeah. It'd be it would, you could do it while you wait if you do molecular mechanics, but the results may not be accurate enough. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a trade off in accuracy and and speed. So I'll show you that here in a sec. Um, so here we have this model selection guide. You know, if you're doing the structure of a large molecule, you can use UFF. Um, the, you know, we, we can't ever really get to the perfect Schrodinger equation because it would take infinite time. And so let me show you, uh, we'll, we're gonna have to continue the notes on Monday, but let me just show you this one thing on the time, okay? So this was on a molecule that has uh, 300 basis uh, functions on the 6-31G. And here's the time it took to calculate that molecule as we improved both the software and the hardware. And these are supercomputers in the early days. It took a week, an hour. Then we get to desktop machines. I did these bottom calculations. And so it was under five minutes from months to five minutes. And then I had one on the desktop that took two weeks and if I take the same mathematical, you know, time formula, this would take 1,500 years on the first one. <laughs> and it blows your mind. It would, you know, you could start a calculation in 67 and it would take 1,500 years, or you could wait like 30 years and do the same calculation and take two weeks. <laughs> so this is crazy how fast computers are speeding up. So. What we can do on the desktop now, they could e not even do at all in the, in the other days. So on this faster computer that we have in computer science, it might drop that down too substantially. So we'll continue on Monday.